Hey, Lennon, I'm Kevin. Hey, nice to meet you. From DigiKey. So, where are we? So, we are at the University of Wisconsin, Madison Makerspace. It's kind of the colloquial name that's used. Uh, the official name is the Granger Engineering Design Innovation Lab. Okay. This is an absolute beautiful facility. I'm, I'm excited to walk through and see what you have to offer. So, uh, when did you start uh, the Makerspace? How long have you been open? We've been open since September of last year. Okay. so. Pushing a so, year. So yeah, it's coming up on a year. That's great. So when you initially thought of a makerspace, were, were you one of the, the brains behind the operation? I was brought in fairly early, but they had already had the concept, the funding existed. Um, they had a lot of committees that had been formed before I came on to give a lot of suggestions and input, but it was really nice. It was pretty much a blank canvas in terms of the actual, what this thing lo looks like. and so. I worked with students actually last summer. There was a group of about 10 students and we got together and then uh, we just thought of different ideas. They had gr actually a lot of what ended up coming out of this space was from ideas from students. Okay. Um, and then some based on some of my past experience and then we brought Carl in uh, who you'll meet in, uh, in July okay. of last year and so he was part of it too. So when, uh, when you first, or the whole team first had your first idea of let's open this up, how long do you think it took? You know, on average, I mean, obviously discussions start early. But like on our side? Yeah. Yeah, we had pretty much the summer. So we started okay. in, I started in June of last year as a new employee here, and we opened the doors in September. Um, so that was, that was kind of it, and it was a real ramp up. Okay, wow. That's, yeah, that's really quick. So um, I see this is your, your 3D printing village. Um, yep. So how do students like, uh, or, I, so let me ask you this first. Is this open to just students or the community or how, do, how does that work? It's a good question. So um, right now how we have it, and everything I say is like in a lot of things, it's in version 1.0, so it okay. could change. Yeah, of course. Um, of course. But we have it now that we are mainly a resource for the College of Engineering, but okay. anytime we can add value through collaborations with other departments, which there are a lot of them. We can bring other people in. So we've been working with the School of Human Ecology, which is kind of the design uh, department here okay. at UW, um, and then also the School of Business. And we're very open in, in other ways too. But for the most part, it's for the, un, in mainly undergrads, but also uh, graduate students in the College of Engineering. Okay, great. So. Um, so tell me a little bit about the 3D printing area. I mean, we don't need to get into specifics or anything, but I see you have multiple styles of printers. Yep. Um, yeah, it's kind of the fifty to $100,000 question of where you <laughs> yeah. throw all your money in terms of if you're buying a bunch of lower cost printers. Individually, they're not much, but when you buy a bunch of them, it gets kind of pricey for all the replacement parts and things like that. Yep. Um, we ended up going with the Ultimaker 3s, um, and then later on, we added the Form 2 printers. Uh, later on, IE is like a few weeks later, so we bought these and then we decided, hey, we want some of the form printers and we bought more of those. Um, but that's kind of been our strategy. You can see we're set up for a decent amount of volume. Uh, yeah. There are thousands of engineering students. We get 1,000 new students every year as freshmen. Oh, wow. So that's kind of the environment that we're in. So it's set up for students to be able to easily come in and work with the student staff to, to make prints. So a, a quick overview, if a student comes in, you're an engineering student, and they want to 3D print something, if they already have the file ready to go, how, how does that process work, and do they have to pay for the materials? Yep, so they, uh, we had a honeymoon period where they didn't pay for the materials, that's kind of over. Um, but now, basically what they do is we try to make the barrier to entry as low as we can. Yeah. So there is um, a permit system that's used across the college that has been used since the 90s, or it was established in early 2000s, um, where students have to take an online quiz to get a, a basic permit. And they would, so they would do that ahead of time. They would come in, and then they would work with the student staff. Okay. And really the permit in the case, in this case, the, low, the lowest one is just to get them in our system, get their name so we can, we know who they are and the, their affiliation and things like that. So um, we'll start heading off to the next area. So when we talk about um, a student staff, I'm assuming the student staff kind of runs the makerspace on a day-to-day -day basis? That's the vision, and I think it's been working pretty well. So yeah, we currently have 25 student staff, and the idea is that when students come in, they feel like us old guys and girls are out of the picture. Like they actually, and you guys may have seen this coming in, 
hopefully we're not the first face you would normally see as a student. Um, so they would come in and uh, would be one of those student staff. So that's kind of the idea. And most of the student staff, I'm assuming, are in the engineering program of some sort. Most, yeah, like probably two thirds ish okay. are. But we're we don't we definitely don't turn anyone away if they are outside the College of Engineering and have the skills uh, at all. We probably don't actively recruit those as much outside of engineering, but. Um, you'll meet in this space people, student staff from the art department, the business school, School of Human Ecology. Um, it's, they're actually you know, really great staff to have around. So it's, uh, at the roots, we want it to be an interdisciplinary staff too of students. And that's a great way to do it. I mean, if they're, they're into engineering and trying to figure out you know, how to do this stuff, do I want to do something like this for a living? I mean, this is a, a great facility to work at as well as play around in. Yeah, the idea is that hopefully we invest in these student staff. They obviously provide a lot of value here. And then we, we've already had to start giving letters of recommendation and it's super easy for us to do it. And so the hope is that they're really attractive to people um, for employer, employees, employers that are looking to hire. Yeah, that, that's amazing. So here's your laser cutter, laser cutter slash yep. engraver. Um, what can you tell me about this? Well, yeah, this is kind of our more uh, industrial quality laser cutter. We're still exploring. You could see in the 3D printers that we have more consumer uh, benchtop grade. This one, you know, you can buy uh, Glowforge and other benchtop laser cutters. Uh, we didn't go that approach yet, so right now we're kind of keeping on the, the higher end for the laser cutter, and it seems to work well because I think one laser cutter, it works so quickly that as long as you're queuing people properly, you can get a lot of people through if it's properly maintained. And that kind of goes back to our student staff too, because each of the student staff have a manager position. So you'll meet Andrea, who's a good example. She's from the art department. She's a graduate student, and she is the manager of this laser cutter. And so she has her own toolbox with the tools inside that are special to this machine. And she has a maintenance schedule that she goes through, and okay. she does a great job. So it is all the equipment is maintained by the student? It's maintained by the students according to manufacturer specifications. <laughs> yeah. So we don't encourage creativity in terms of trying new things in oh, terms of the maintenance, in but in terms of, of yeah. how the machine is used, um, you know, we encourage students to you know, go for it in terms of their whatever they want to make. Yeah. And this thing is great for you know, building your own enclosures and even engraving. I mean, yes, that's right. Yeah. Engraved uh, digi-key on the back of my yeah. iPad. Actually, yeah, the, the, uh, behind 3D printing, this has probably been the most actively used uh, okay. machine. Cool. Yep. So this looks like it's more the, the electronic space. And as DigiKey, you know, as we're uh, an electronics distributor, this is the kind of stuff that we sell. We love to, to see these kind of places in a maker space. Yeah, so even, even it seems kind of uh, bread and butter, I actually think that this is probably one of the most unique parts of our space, that this amount and quality of electronics is available to any engineering student. It's more traditional in electrical engineering, but for a mechanical engineer, this is an amazing resource that they normally wouldn't have so freely available. So how I, we're here in the summer, so I'm sure there's some students here with uh, summer classes, but is it quite busy during the school year? During the school year, it definitely is. And even during the summer, it has been. Like last week, we just finished up um, a summer course that we had. Um, and it was, it was actually quite packed. And, and even t tomorrow we have programs coming through. So the summer is very dependent on the programs that we run. During the school year, it's a little bit more of the tinkers that come in combined with courses and combined with programming that we have. But yeah, we definitely see a drop during the summer because students just leave. They go, and actually we want them to leave. We try to help them get internships at wherever their dream place is. And okay. so they're, it's a success for us if a lot of students are gone during the summer working in internships. So would you consider yourself a maker? Do you use the equipment and play around with it? Yeah, I do. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, so I was, uh, yeah, definitely I started more in the machine shop and then I was kind of straddled that era once lower cost 3D printers came in and laser cutters and that kind of stuff. So. It's amazing the way the technology has changed over the past, you know, even three, four years. I mean, a 3D printer has gone from thousands of dollars to hundreds of dollars. It's yep. unbelievable. Yep. All right, let's head on over to your, your workshop, your wood shop here. So if you were to give any other school or 
you know, area of the industry that are looking at building a makerspace. Do you have any suggestions for them? Um, I know it's not easy opening a makerspace. So I, I well, yeah, that's a good question. I think it really depends on what they already have. So we were super fortunate, and it's kind of opportune to talk about it in this space, is that we already had a machine shop with eight full-time staff. I don't think you guys have seen that spot yet. No, I have not. But it's super impressive, and actually, because I'm new to UW, and so that was one of the things that was really impressive, was um, that shop. It's about the same machine shop. is about the same square footage as what you see here. Um, so there you have mill, 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 lathe, yeah. lathe, 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 water jet, welding equipment, woodworking. So that is for really students that are interested in more precision metal work. And, and with the full-time staff that they have there, it is great. Um, so I guess that it depends. So if you have that, it's kind of a different flavor versus if you don't. Yeah. So when we made this makerspace, we had that. And so you don't need to have as much of this kind of equipment. Um, so it actually makes our life a little easier in some ways. I think if you have to create it all from scratch. Yeah, if you have the, the, the starting point, you know, the foundation yep. build, it's easier to build off it. I, I definitely understand. So that, I mean, I think that it really depends in general, but I think if I were to give one piece of advice, I think if you give a, get a tour of these spaces, it's really great to see the equipment and all that stuff, but it's largely, as you know, about the team and the community that you build. Yeah. I mean, so these, this piece, these, equipment, these pieces of equipment you could buy and have in a week if you wanted them, but really that team, the culture, all that stuff takes a lot yeah. of time and thought. Um, and so that's, I think, the biggest piece of advice is just to really think about that, who you hire, who's the shop manager. Um, Carl is amazing, and he just has that right sense of community and patience with student, students um, that makes it a lot easier. So I think yeah. that's usually the trickiest part is to get that right team. So going back to the staff and the students, how, how do you guys train them? And I'm assuming the student staff will eventually train the students coming in to use the equipment. Yeah. Um, it's, that is a good question. Um, we don't have a formal training program yet for our staff. There is a formal training program throughout the whole college, so okay. they do go through that. Um, okay. But we're developing it now, so that's kind of step one for yeah. us, and we've been developing it over the last year. Um, but we want to develop a system similar to what the machine shop here already has, where they have a, it's something like a year where students go through, their student staff uh, go through training for about a year. Oh, wow. Um, and they actually have uh, content that they go through, textbooks basically, that they go through for, uh, for learning how to be a machinist and use the tools. And so a lot of the stuff doesn't exist in some ways. There are 3D printer books and things like that, but we've, we're in talks, we have a lot of different ideas on how to formalize that training. Well, and it's gotta be hard to train them because the 3D printer technology changes every day. It so changes, train, yeah. train them on one printer and the next day you get a new version. It out. changes and I think that it, it it's one thing to have a 3D printer that's on your bench at your house. It's another, the, we're using consumer grade printers in an industrial type of setting and operation where these things are operating all the time around the clock. So we, we even have to teach our students things like there's a difference between um, you know, maintenance and repair and things, preventative maintenance versus just like repair or fixing it. We wanna do preventative maintenance. Yeah. So setting up that culture and teaching them to Fix, fix things before they break, basically maintain them so they don't break. Um, so that we, even those little things you'd think, maybe a, a more experienced engineer would already know, but it's part of the engineering learning is the, to learn how to do preventative maintenance and have that kind of schedule that you fix it before it breaks, yeah. basically. Yeah. So um, as we walk over here, another question I have is, how important do you think it is, being a school for engineers and engineering, whether it's mechanical, electrical, uh, any kind of engineering, biomedical, how important is it to have a space like this? I think um, it's becoming the norm, I would say. I mean, and some people have used the analogy like a gym. Yep. You know, it'd be like back in the day before. I mean, I think gyms have been around pretty much forever, so you could took, look at libraries or any other kind of shared campus resource. Yeah. They tend to sprout up in engineering, which makes sense. Um, but I think they will be just like a library or a gym on college campuses. It's kind of ex expected. Not to say that will be forever. I mean, there are fads that come and go, but I think it will, it will be that ubiquitous uh, in all college campuses. And I think we've already started to see it. But I do think there's a difference between uh, this kind of space and other schools have them too, which is like a multi-million dollar investment. And that just shows 
a different level of commitment in usually alumni <laughs> funding of some sort. And that is awesome. And the more that can happen, it's great. It is, and I, I would imagine getting the funding is not easy. I mean, a lot of people are into the technology and they'll invest into it, but it's still a lot of legwork to get that funding. Yep, the, the money to buy the equipment and then the staffing. I yeah. think even the staffing is probably more. Um, and so that's what's nice about UW is that they actually, before I started, had, had a gift from the Granger Foundation they had the money, and I know a lot of people out there just starting. Yeah. They've got to actually start there, which you know is a, is a different um, it's a different set of, of challenges. But um, I think you know it's it's important to have that um, that funding stream. I think, you, like I said, it's so. What I like is if you're a maker, like for instance, uh, electrical engineer, you walk in this front door, you can have your circuit board designed. You can sit at all the tables, use the Wi-Fi, create your circuit board. You can come over to the Bantam Tools, the desktop milling machine. You can etch your, or not etch, but uh, mill out your circuit board. Yep. Step back over here. You can order all your components from DigiKey, throwing our DigiKey plug in there. Order all your parts from DigiKey, have them the next day, solder it all up, go to the 3D printer, print an enclosure, or laser cut your enclosure, and within a day you can have an, a complete finished product. Or yeah, prototype. that's the that's the idea. Yeah, it's really the we. We like to say that it's limitless here. Yep. Um, in, in reality, there are some limits, but I think that we, we want to put it in the students' court that however much time they'll invest in the space, they'll get out of it. It's just up to them yeah. to kind of put in the time. And it's, we don't want there to be barriers, like yeah, the ones exactly. you're talking about, traditional barriers of like ha having to wait weeks or days or whatever. For your, your board, just to get a, yep. a PCB board, I mean, you have to wait exactly days, yep. weeks, even sometimes months, depending on where you order it from. Yep. So yeah, I, I mean, this facility, like I said, I've been doing quite a few maker spaces. I have uh, definitely a, a spot in my heart for maker spaces because I love making myself. So this is a beautiful facility. Um, just one other thing I'd like to talk about is this is obviously your checkout window. So yep. a lot of the areas you see, there's not tools out. So if you want to use a tool, I'm assuming you have to come here to check it out. Yep. Uh, that's something it's kind of funny is it so this used to be a library an engineering library and okay. i wasn't around when it was an engineering library but i guess it had a smell to it of <laughs> old 1960s furniture and books and things like that but all that to say we try to preserve that library uh spirit in a sense of the of the space and i think it has very practical uses so students um, can come in they can check out all different kinds of technology virtual reality headsets um, microelectronics like you mentioned before, for the most part, we say, hey, go to DigiKey or a service like yeah. that and order those parts because it's so easy to get. But we want to provide the parts that aren't as easy to get. Yeah. And some of the things that are expensive for students to have to buy if they just want to learn, um, just like a book, you just want it, want it for a period of time. And then if you, you'll learn something from it and maybe build a larger system or go out and get some funding and then you could buy it on your own. But at least they could come here and use it for a fixed amount of time and then share it as more of you know, a shared resource. It's such a great idea. I mean, looking back in there, it's just, I, I could sit here and live here for like a week just playing around. My, my wife probably wouldn't like that. But yeah. <laughs> I, I can definitely live here for a while. So are you looking to expand at all? That's a good question. Yeah, so the um, we are, but not in a traditional, I guess, more equipment sense. Like we probably will continue to buy some more equipment, but we're really looking more on the program side. Okay. So the first floor will be renovated. It's similar kind of square footage but it will be the home uh, to more programs. Um, okay. Because kind of what I mentioned before is that I think you always have the tinkers. It should always be a, a spot for tinkers and people doing their own projects. Um, but the academic program that goes along with it, I think, is a different particular kind of flavor, but that's kind of the flavor we're also heading towards. So we're gonna have a master's degree uh, in, interdis in interdisciplinary design. Um, we're supporting the capstone design courses and things like that, and that will all go on the first floor. Okay. So they'll come up here to make, but they'll go downstairs to do more of the collaborations, um, the assembly of items, meetings, whiteboards, this kind of thing will be all downstairs. And this space will, you'll see m uh, more equipment and less studio space. Okay. And downstairs will be all the studio space. That's great. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time. And again, beautiful facility. Uh, we really appreciate, appreciate you doing this interview with us because maker spaces, like you said, are most universities have them now. It's yep. becoming the norm. Yep. So it's really cool just to see how they, how they were dreamed up and how they've come to fruition. I mean, look, look at this beautiful area. Yeah. So I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Lennon.
think that's it. All right.